Welcome to Conversations on Resilient Leadership. I'm Jim DeVries, founder of Enhance International Group and your host for today's episode. This podcast series is where we dive deep into the minds of leaders who have not only navigated through uncertainty, but have emerged stronger, more innovative, and more resilient. Whether you're a seasoned executive or an emerging leader, each episode offers you unique access to the strategies and insights of top leaders who are redefining leadership in today's dynamic environment. Today, I have the privilege of sitting down with a remarkable leader, John Cosgrove, president of Atlantic Handling Systems from the great state of New Jersey. John J. Cosgrove is the founder and president of Atlantic Handling Systems, a leading materials handling solution provider. John is a successful businessman, government official, and community volunteer. He's a lifelong resident of Fairlawn, New Jersey. John's volunteer activities are numerous, to say the least. (laughs) He has held every office in the Fairlawn Fire Department and served as fire chief in 1997. That's where it kind of starts, and then it keeps going on. He was awarded the Fire Department Valor Award, the Citation Star for Bravery, in the VFW Valor Award in 1991 for his heroic actions in the rescue of unconscious man from a burning house fire. He has served on the board of directors of the following, the foundation at the Bergen New Bridge Medical Center, the Material Handling Equipment Distributors Association, where he was president in 2007, the Fairlawn High School Athletic Hall of Fame, the Fairlawn Chamber of Commerce, the Adopt-a-Soldier Platoon. He currently serves as chairman for the Fairlawn Community Center, 501C3. He has served two terms as president of the Fairlawn Sunrise Rotary and has been named the Paul Harris Ferris twice on the contributions of the Rotary. He was named Fairlawn Citizen of the Year in 2007. He's a three-time recipient of the Bergen County Volunteer of the Year Award in the recipient of the Bergen Regional Medical Center Benefactor Award. And then he was elected the Fairlawn governing body and served five consecutive terms as a mayor of Fairlawn. He also served three terms as the borough's deputy mayor. He is also the recipient of the 2015 Care Plus Foundation Courage Award, which honors his service and courage regarding the advancement of mental health. In February, 2017, He received a Lifetime Achievement Award for his leadership from the Bergen Regional Medical Center Foundation, where he served as chairman of the board for 12 years. So, John, I was thinking about cutting this short, but I really think it is important for people to understand all your accomplishments. It's it's pretty, pretty amazing. Thank you. You're you're truly one of a kind. As we said before, you broke the mold when they make John (laughs) Cosgrove. And I hear people say that all the time, every time. So it's a real honor to have the privilege of working with you for these past three years and learning from your leadership, your openness, your integrity. And you blow me away every time I spend time with you. I'm always learning from you. So, John, a few words from opening from your perspective. Well, you know, Jim, thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. And, you know, For me, you know, having been involved with Rotary is the world's largest service organization. And our motto is service above self. And it was instilled in me by my parents. Both my parents were uh, people who volunteered in in the community and and helped people. And and so I I owe a lot of that to them. You know, they, they instilled it in me that, you know, a measure of a person's worth isn't really how many material things they have, but it's what they do for other people. Well, you've you've more than accomplished that <laughs> in your life. Uh, you should be very proud of all the things you've done, and I'm sure everybody will continue tapping your shoulder to ask. Just your humility and the way you present yourself is is second to none. Thank you. So I think that really makes you the ideal candidate for this series on leadership because you have really shown what a real leader is. So what does leadership mean to you, John? 
Leadership, I have to tell you, you know, the 40 years that I spent in the fire department, I learned a lot about leadership. And, and what I learned was that, you know, there aren't, there isn't too many things we can't accomplish when we all work together. And if you're the leader, you know, you, you can't ask people to do things that you wouldn't do, you know, right. and, and being in the fire department, you know, it, you're not making decisions like you're doing business. Okay. Let's try to, you know, there are life and death decisions and you have to, you have to direct people to, to go into, you know, harm's way and you have to be able, it's a lot like the military, you know, and, and there's a chain of command. And I, I think that that really helped me to develop my leadership skills was going through the ranks in the fire department. And, you know, when I finally became the chief of the fire department, you know, I, I was, I thought I was ready to be able to lead. And, and so that helped me in the business world also and everything else I've done. That's a great story. Is there any one particular person or a, a group of people that inspired you to want to be a leader and follow that path? You might have already answered it with your family, but outside mm -hmm. of your family. Well, number one, of course, was my dad. You know, my, my dad was the kind of guy. He My dad was in the invasion of uh, Europe, you know, on Normandy mm -hmm. Beach at 21 years old. And I'm sure that's where he learned his leadership skills. But my dad died when I was 18 years old. So mm. that made me grow up overnight. You know, I, I ended up uh, becoming, you know, maturity and uh, I, I began to focus. And I, and I think good leaders focus. They 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 take a look at what uh, the uh, the end result should be and they focus on that and they don't let all the uh, peripheral things bother them. You know, you, you have to stay focused on the end game. So was so that was the time you decided you wanted to be a leader, or was it evolving from? You, it sounded like you were kind of forced into it at eighteen, but you know well, a little bit on that, that side. On and, but but you know, know when I when I played sports in high school and kind, you know, I I was you know a captain at times, and you know it, it you begin to and it, I'm six foot four, and you know I, I I had the honor when I was the mayor of Fairlawn to go to my kindergarten teacher's hundredth birthday. <laughs> and, you know, she, you know, I was always taller than everybody else. So we would go on a field trip and it would be like, everybody follow John. Cause you could see me, you know, and I got to make it her day in Fairlawn, which was, which was a great thing. You know, and she was a great lady. So being the tallest is a, is a good indication of, of may, maybe being the leader. <laughs> well, yeah. I guess, like you said before, you're kind of forced into it because you're like a foot taller than everyone else, you know, so. And well, I was very tall at a young age, so. I, I knew a lot of tall people in my school and they weren't all leaders, John, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I would I would say it. there's something else in you that uh, made you, like, they, like your wife may have said, you know, they broke the mold when they made you, you know. I, I think there's more than just your height that made you a great leader. Thank you. It might have been a, to take that advantage of it and turn it into, you know, really a, you know, what you've done over your life is is pretty amazing. So yeah. are there any turning points in your career where, you know, you had those big pivot moments? You mentioned the fire department. Are there any other? Oh, yeah. And my, on my business side, I, you know, on my business side, when I got involved in my industry 45 years ago, you know, I was lucky enough to be successful at early. But what happened was I joined a trade organization. And the name of it is the Material Handling Equipment Dealers Association. And when I joined that, you know, I got involved. And I think, you know, anyone who wants to be a leader, make sure that you engage with other leaders, you know, mm -hmm. and you get to learn from them. So I was put on a board with 12 other people who were, you know, they, they were unbelievable, you know, leaders and, and great people. And I got to learn from, it was like, it was like getting a master's degree. You know, we'd go to these board meetings and I'd just sit and, and, and I'd listen, but you know, what it did is it helps you to um, think about becoming a leader <clears throat> And actually, when I started Atlantic Handling 20 years ago, my partner at the time, John Mayberry, he had been the president of Mahita the year before I was president. So he and I had a great relationship. And I'll, I'll be very honest with you, the way we started Atlantic was he uh, you know, had been working with another company for years and things had kind of gone sour there. 
So he always told me, if you want to do something, let me know. So I called him and said, I'm ready. And he said, come on up Thursday night. I drove to Massachusetts. We went to a restaurant and had dinner and he turned over the placemat and we put together a business plan on the placemat, which he still has in his office today. So <laughs> you have that framed on the office or yeah, I don't I don't know if it's framed. I know it's in his office though. So. <laughs> That's great. It's a great it success. It has a little rofer dressing on it too. So you know Yeah. Well, if it didn't, it wouldn't be real, right? Right, right, exactly. So yeah. Everything everything good in this world started with a paper napkin, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> But so I, will, what, I will tell you one of the things about leadership for me was, uh, you know, I've read some book, many books over the years on on different things, you know, and I read the Stephen Covey book, yeah, you know, and yeah. I've really tried to, I've tried to embrace the part where he has four circles that intersect evenly. It's business, family, spiritual, and health. And mm -hmm. I've, I've tried to follow that, but, you know, anyone who's a leader will tell you, there's a lot of times it gets out of skew because you're you're focused on something and you you know you get out of skew on it so you have to bring it all back together mm -hmm. and you know talk about you know in bi business and then I had a government career where I served five terms as the mayor of a city that has thirty five thousand people and you know all my experience in in business and leadership I think helped me there a lot because uh, I did five terms as mayor and three terms as the deputy mayor. So I was in government for a long time, and it was a big transition because in business, you can walk into a room, and if you're the CEO and the president, you can make a change in a minute. In government, you go into the room, and you talk about a change, and there's 10 people in the room that are going to tell you 20 things, reasons you can't. So that, you know, that that's the way it works. And, you know, I've been, I've been fortunate that, you know, I had had a lot of experience that way from the fire department and knew, you know, you have to get people to buy in. You know, that, that's a big, key, important part about leadership. You know, you have to get people to trust you and to and to buy in what you want to do and accomplish. And a lot of that we've done through strategic planning, to be honest with you. Yeah, I think you bring up a great point about Kobe in his book, and it's affected so many people throughout the years. And, you know, one of the areas that you just mentioned at the end there, trust, is is building that trust in 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 that environment especially when you're you're in a government uh group it's even more important but even with your own employees and your company in different organizations i think john i think that's what you've done so well is you're just very very trustworthy if john says it you know mm -hmm. it's right and having that kind of a building that type of uh you know leadership presence around i think is you know what i've seen and observed about you so maybe that kobe book is a, one of the classics that anyone right. can read anytime <laughs> any time of your life and you can get something out of that book no matter where you're at you know i i think i just had a conversation with one of my employees and he was talking to me about you know he he's very focused on what he wants to do and he said to me you know what, when do you, you know, when is it acceptable to be a bulldog or not? And, you know, and I said to him, you know, no matter what you do, listen to people and then take a step back and, and, and evaluate it. And, and that's what I try to do. I've tried to do that in government where I didn't, I didn't, you know, and I would, I was a, my political party, there's three to one difference between my political party and my town's political party. So I was a, my, my party hadn't had a mayor in, in 40 years until I became the mayor. And, you know, we had one, you know, so what was happened is we were, you know, I, I had a deal with a council that was four people of the opposite uh, party. And, you know, we didn't play politics because it's a small, it's, you know, 35,000 people, but we left all that stuff at the door. And, you know, we talk about special needs and stigma and mental health, things like that. You know, I think we, we got to the point where we had an understanding where that that's what really matters. You know, what really mattered was trying to do what's best for our, our uh, do what's best for the people of our community. And, and that's that's what we tried to convey. And we did it. I think, you know, we, we had a very successful run. You know, un unfortunately for me, 
six and a half years ago, I had a stroke, but I've recovered 100%. And so I didn't run for re-election. And it was time because that circle from my family was starting to drift out where it wasn't intersecting with everything else. So I, you know, I think it was a, a, a really good move on my part. You know, after doing that, I do believe in term limits for people because, you know, mm -hmm. you can't do the same job, you know, 15, 20 years later that you were doing when you first engaged. So, yeah, yeah, term limits are very, very important thing for, for us all. We right. got to change, do something. So, is there any particular part of being, obviously, you've been a leader most of your life. Uh, is there anything that re you really enjoy about being a leader? What what really get, keeps you going? And and even when you made that transition of not leading, and you had your stroke, you kind of had a uh, a wake up call, so to speak. You know, what 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 do you? Because I noticed even after you stop something, you tend to fill it in pretty quickly with something new. <laughs> right. But I need you know I need something to keep me motivated. But, you know, one of the things that I've that I've learned over the years is when you do something and you reach the top or the pinnacle of it and you leave, you know, I, I told the mayor who came in after me, you're not going to see me at the microphone. I'm not going to be criticizing you in the newspapers or anything else. You know, I respect it's your time. And I, even if I don't, if I don't agree with you, we have enough of a good relationship. And he and I, we would go to lunch every once in a while. And if I didn't, you know, he would ask my opinion, but I, I wouldn't go after and, and do that. And sometimes people have a big problem with that. And I think that's what kills organizations, to be honest with you. People will hang on too long. And even after they're gone, they want to continue to be a giant influencer. And, you know, I never did that. I, I found something different. So when I left, when I left the council, I had been a member of a Rotary Club and little by little, I had been approached a couple of times to become the district governor, which is the large, it's the highest position within your district. So I did that. And one of the great things for me, you know, Rotary, we do service projects all over the world. I've been involved in water projects in Honduras for people who didn't, didn't have any clean drinking water, 40% of a village. And you know, and, and what makes it what makes it all worthwhile is, you know, we got a we did a video to raise money and it showed these young boys with buckets standing on a plank over a well and, and raising them up on a rope and getting water and bringing it back to their house and dumping it in a 55 gallon drum. Then when we finally got water to them, we built a solar, a solar powered well and, and pump and a water retainage place. When they finally got water, they had a night, a big barbecue, and they showed the kids running around in the water. It was great. They were like a big sprinkler. So, you know, all the houses now have water. So, I mean, wow. that's something that it helps you sleep pretty easy at night when you think you can do that. And we did it from little Fairlawn, New Jersey. We affected a, a whole bunch of people, you know, 10,000 people in a, a village in uh, Honduras. That's a great story. I, I mean, those are really enjoyable moments when you are able to affect change like that for right, right. communities. I, I th that's really noble. And one sure. thing about leadership I just wanted to comment on was, sure. uh, you know, everyone who goes out into the world and does things and tries to be a leader, you're going to experience failures. And and the, the thing you have to do is let build on those failures. You know, um, in the fire department, I'll never forget the date. It was January 9th, 1984. We had a fire in a section of our uh, community. It was a Christmas tree fire. And there was an 18 month old baby in the house. And we went in and got the baby out. And unfortunately the baby passed away. Mm -hmm. So that haunted us for several years. But I think what we did was we turned it into, we trained harder, we did more. And uh, as you said before, I was involved in a rescue uh, in uh, a few years after that. And uh, what happened was we were ready. And, and that the joy of that night when we, we saved this man made it all, all the hard training and everything, you know, worth it. Brilliant story. Very, very touching story. Thank you.
So is there anything that you see in leaders out there today that, you know, are appealing to you? I'm sure you run across a lot of leaders out there. Any inspirations that you gain from other leaders? Yeah, you know, there's a lot of people in the world that are, are great leaders. And and the people that I find that I respect the most are the people who, you know, they didn't have to be a leader. They, they stepped forward because, you know, they didn't want to be a leader, but they might step forward to be a leader. And I think if you read, I read a book, what's his name, the guy, First Things First? No, no, Jim Johnson. He, talk, he talks about it's a, a comparison of leaders in the world. And most mm-hmm. of the great leaders that he did an analysis of certain leaders are people mm-hmm. who are somewhat humble. You know, and that that that's what really bothers me about the political landscape today. You yeah. Know, there's not many humble leaders in, in politics today. You I know? don't know if you can. Can you be humble and be a political right, leader right, today? You know, and it's the same thing in a lot of things. But I, I think in business, there's a lot of people... You know, our parent company, John Mayberry, who you got to meet. I really respect John Mayberry because he's a very humble guy. And, mm-hmm. you know, people know that he cares about them. You know, he cares about their family. He cares about, you know, if, if their child's sick or if their wife is sick or whatever, whatever it might be. You know, if you show people you care, they're going to follow you, you know. That, that's great words of wisdom right there is is really caring for people and putting their family first over the business that's what i often see that and uh, give and give people worth you know yeah, I mean, and that's a, everybody's valuable the question yeah. is are you in the right place in for your job you might be not doing the job that you're cut out to do but you not you don't know that you're doing it for the wrong reasons that job i i think finding i'm sure you've done this many times john of finding helping people find their way of what they're really passionate about right. so that they can really excel because all too often folks are doing a job because their father did it or their mother did it, or because it just happened to be where they ended up. That's I love, I love mentoring people, you know, whether it's in, you know, the civic organizations I'm involved in or business, you know, it, it to me, that gives me a lot of great deal of self-satisfaction to uh, work with people and see them grow and, and, and succeed. Nice. So do you have any, I mean, I feel like you've done already shared this, but I'll just ask the question is what, what are your top three secrets of becoming a great leader? All everything we discussed, could you just summarize what are the top three things folks should look out to be uh, looking for to do? No, number one, show people you care. Number two is to make sure you stay focused on what the end result has to be. You know, what what success going to be? Is it, you know, and stay focused on that. And the third thing is to have people buy in. You know, I talk about the fire department. There's two million firefighters in the United States. 1.8 million of them are volunteer firefighters. It's the most dangerous career there is. How do you get 1.8 million people to not get paid, right? There's no there's no money. What it is is self-satisfaction. You know, give people something that they feel worth about and you're going to be a great leader. Those are great words of wisdom that we can all take away. Thank you, John. So... Just changing it up a little bit, can you provide a turnaround story of how you've encountered a failure and how you've turned that into success? I'm sure you have a few. <laughs> well, when I became mayor of Fairlawn, we had a lot of dissension within our police department, lawsuits, so on and so forth. So got all the stakeholders together, sat down and, and said, okay, what does success look like for us? Well, success looks like if we could, you know, build a department where, you know, the police felt good about themselves and, and the town felt good about the police department. So we worked on some things and I asked, what what is the what is the police like organizations and the state look at and think success is? And they said to get accredited. 
So what we did is we took an officer and we put him full time on just working on accreditation. So only one in three police departments in New Jersey are accredited. Hmm. So we worked on it. We worked on it. And the final thing is you have to go sit before a panel of 12 police chiefs. And it's the mayor how to answer these questions. And it, it was pretty, you know, it was like being in front of a Senate hearing. But, uh, and and one of the great things was they said, well, we see that uh, four police officers were, were laid off two years ago. How can you explain that? I go, that was the prior administration. I hired four back. So it worked, you know, but it was good. And what happened was we were accredited. Now we've been accredited three times since that time. And the lawsuit stopped. You know, we, we had an understanding. And, and you know, that, that part of leadership is to be able to, to develop relationships with people. You know, it's a, it's a huge part. Relationships still mean a lot. You know, if you, it, when you find that golden nugget in any organization, make sure that you keep them by your side. And I, I've found that all the time, every, everything I've done. Yeah, I think in organizations, we often, often start creating pillars of power in the organization. Right. And I'm really interested to hear how you have figured out how to dismantle that and turn that negative type of action by certain people that want to do that in, in the organization. How did you turn that around, if I could ask? Well, my wife says that I have good radar. So a lot of times when I go into a situation, I'll, I'll, I'll look around the room and I'll, I'll figure out who I think is going to help row the boat with you and who's going to try to stop you. So the most important thing to work on is if you know the person's going to row the boat on with you, you develop a good relationship with them automatically. But when you look at the person who's going to be contrary and, and negative and so on and so forth, and you have to deal with them, you have to win them over and you got, you got to find something, some common ground to, to, to encourage them, to motivate them and to get them to see, you know, the end result, that end result. So I've, so I've been fortunate. Find... I'm sorry. Go ahead. I've been fortunate enough to, to uh, be able to help have people kind of come along with me sometimes. So, so do you techniques to do that are that there's, different techniques to do that from a leadership perspective. Can you share some of those techniques? Number one, listen. Listen to people. Don't, you know, don't disregard because you don't agree with them what they're saying. You know, try to try to hear them out, find some common ground. And and you know, the technique is listen and then and then try to try to work together. And and if you if you can win somebody's trust, you know, uh, there are people who they, they didn't agree with me on a lot of things, but they respected me because I, I listened to them. Yeah, we're right back to trust again, aren't we? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's fantastic. Thanks, John. So we're going to kind of switch to the, the last topic of the podcast here on the state of the state, making it apolitical, you know, the economy, we're recovering from COVID, so to speak, and the COVID is over and uh, a lot of people say we're in a soft landing and really what where do you see things going after the election you know just leave that off the table whether it's red or blue so to speak yeah where do you it, see the economy going in in the future for the u.s and where should the u.s be looking at in, in my traffic? business the interest rates are uh, have been uh, a major factor for somewhat of a downturn. You know, people who budgeted a year and a half ago, two years ago, you know, they were looking at much lower interest rates and the interest went, went up. So hopefully, you know, it dropped a half a point. And if it can continue to go down, that that drives everything. And as far as I see, you know, I think I think we can have a soft landing if we if we can get inflation somewhat under control. Now, you know, they they say inflation is down. Of course it is. But, you know, when you measure it over the last three years, you know, people go to the grocery store, they go to the gas pump, 
all of these things. And energy is a major concern. You know, I mean, it, mm -hmm. you know, my job is a Pacific Valley sewage commissioner. You know, I, I understand that, you know, energy is, and, you know, we're trying to do some things. Now, not to say anything political, but I happened to meet with 10 car dealers a couple of weeks ago, and they started talking to me about EV cars. They mm -hmm. told me they're losing $7,500 to $8,000 on each EV car trying to get it off the lot. Now, hybrids are great, but they said that people, when they drive off the lot in an EV car, they're automatically looking at the gauge because they're fearful they're not going to be able to find a place to charge the car. Mm -hmm. but, but hybrids, you know, people have that sense of security so they're trying to, and then there was a representative there from Ford and, and he said that Ford actually pays Tesla money to meet their government standards for electric cars. They, wow. they borrow for that, you know, they have to pay them money and, and use that as to meet their, their things. So I think, I think that the energy part of it is a key component. You know, I'm, I'm all about, you know, alternative energy. I think it's, it'll be great. But I, I think sometimes that we're in a we're in a sprint instead of a run to try to get this done. Yeah. Well, to add to the electricity increase of demand for EVs, of course, you have AI and right. the, the servers that are being put in, enormous power usage. Right. So the grid can't handle it, you know. Yeah, they they can't really handle the increase in demand. And so power prices are going up. I mean, to me, this is just the economy re of resetting itself to more of a, you know, moving off petroleum to some degree. But I, we really haven't moved off petroleum. I don't think our usage is Not any quite. lower. But we're built a really we've built a whole new industry today, right? Of EVs and AI, and unfortunately. Everybody's having to pay for that infrastructure increase. So, you know, we need more power plants. We need more energy. But and that's what's driving that price up. I don't think it's anything to do with Republican or Democrats. I just think it's no, it's, you know, it's just our technology is driving us to use more energy as we automate and automate more. Well, technology has outpaced the grid. And, that, that's a great way to say it. I love that. You know, and we, we really need to, we need to work on it and, you know, we need to be cognizant of it. You know, when I, when I was mayor, we had several major storms, Superstorm Sandy, Irene, and, you know, people, what they take for granted every day, power in their homes oftentimes we're without power for a week, two weeks. And, mm -hmm. you know, you want to see people who get irate, you know, they're yeah. just so used to being able to walk in and flip the switch on. So, you know, yeah, it's an interesting dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. It's very interesting dynamic. Excuse me. So, so yeah, the, the power is, is, is a major issue in in what's coming ai is is of course a big change going on the just the whole new the the new economy so to speak of the the new generation and what they're looking for in their jobs is new that next generation right of what they think is important versus what we or, may or, the, or the work schedule or how many days a week they're going to come in. I mean, this has all changed, you know. COVID kind of made people realize that, you know, you have to do that. And I think in leadership today, one of the things is what I try to do is work with our employees. You know, if you tell me you, you have a situation where you need to be home a couple of days a week and, and you can do your job from at home, you know, we'll try that. You know, where but years ago, no, you have to be here nine to five, you know, that those days are gone, you know, and, and a lot of people today, situations, young families, you know, people with elderly parents that are sick, you know, that that that's something that can and endears them to you and your company by by being flexible. Absolutely. And you know, we were talking about before, you know, 
what what do I think is the major, you know, not only inflation and inflation and interest rates, but also the shakeout of this new dynamic of work. You know, what's going to happen? And you and I did a seminar the other day on AI. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the one thing in my 45 years in this industry, I have never seen anything come onto the scene so rapidly and is beginning. I mean, this is this is not something that's going to evolve over two years or three years. This is going to evolve over the next five years. You're going to see a lot of it, a lot of things driven by AI, as you yeah. and I know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, AI is going to change everything and the companies that embrace it are going to survive. The ones that don't will not survive. The statistics, even before AI, from 2010 to, to now, we've lost 50% of the manufacturing base in the United States. This is before AI. So what do we think AI is going to do to our manufacturing base unless we learn to get to what we call industry 5.0, where AI and people, when we talked about trust before, there's no trust for technology. In, in general, right. there's a lack of trust for technology and they're, everybody's worried about the power. What happens when the power goes off? Then, you, then you're gonna be shut down. You can't run your facility. And, and then the AI, you know, whether, you know, the algorithms and everything will stop and then you'll, you'll lose from that perspective. Mm -hmm. So all these things are intertwined, right? The, the power, the trust of the people, the trust of the organization, the trust of AI, that it's not impeding on my personal, my personal thoughts. I mean, there's a lot wrapped up into this. Yeah, and you know, Jim, before you ask me about three points, I want to add a fourth one. Be, <laughs> be open minded. Yeah. You know, you know, and I know a lot of times I we go into companies that possibly the the you know the parents started the company and it was very successful in the 1980s. Mm. You got to change or die today. You have to be open minded to these things because I've seen in our industry companies that were successful 20 years ago died because they wouldn't make those changes. And, you know, you might have a, a, a parent and their children in the business and the children are, are begging for the change. And the parents like, no, in 1980, we were successful. We did it this way. And that's the way we're going to do it. And in my industry, you know, we, we automate warehouses and that that's, you know, the future because of the labor shortage and, you know, the cost of warehousing today, we can make you more efficient and increase your productivity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I think the auto automation of warehouses and and even production lines, the technology has been around for a while to fully automate a production and, and warehouse. So you only need what may be 50 to 100 people. You only need five to 10 people. The technology exists. It's actually existed for about 10 years. Right. It's not that it... But we in America refuse to use that. The challenge that we have is there's this big country on the other side of the world called China, who's not only using all that technology to automate their processes, but they're scaling it at a much higher level than we are because there's more people, obviously. Right. But they are more efficient in production than we are in the United States but yet we invented all this stuff. So we're not even we're not even eating our own casseroles, souffles, or whatever favorite food you have. They're, it's like we we gave them all, all the ingredients, we gave them the recipes, and then we said, oh no, we're going to we're gonna start up a fire and make grits you know, or, right. or whatever it is, you know, and they're out there making souffles and, and we taught them how to do it. And they, they're in wonderment why we don't want to modernize. Well, I think what, I think what you said before is the, the important part, you know, why haven't we engaged it? And what I've seen is the fear of lost jobs. Yes, the fear of lost jobs, absolutely. And and what happens is we we as Americans need to embrace automation 
but retool and re-educate our workforce to be able to work within it that make will make us more productive. That, I mean, many places I've put automation into the, the job count didn't go down. They just took yeah. the people and had them do things that, you know, different things that, that just increased the productivity. Yeah. We are, we have a lack of people in production, but we want to scale, but we can't scale. And it's stymieing our growth, as you said. Right. So there's so many things we can do to, to reduce the cost per widget that we make while empowering the people that we have. It, I've never been in a facility where all the jobs in the facility were actually being done. There is always things that aren't being done because they say, well, they're not necessary. But then that blows up on you and you have an event right. of, of stuff rotting in the corner, you know. Safety. Safety, yeah. slob, messy, safety issues, like you said, all sorts of things that are being ignored for for in in light of getting production out in doing things from a, a cost out perspective. And it doesn't need to be that way. And now the excuses for doing it right are even less because with automation, your automation equipment, the digital twin, AI vision systems, robust ERPs, all these types of things are available today. And I really feel like the excuses of not automating are running out, especially when the ROI on these automation systems are less than a year. So everybody's worried about interest rates, but if you get your ROI in less than a year with interest rates, is it worth it? Of course. I think it's still it's worth it. Yeah. <laughs> so don't let right. interest rates stop you from... I per I personally don't think you're going to see the interest rates like we had before. You know that was a bargain basement time, and and you know I think once people get adjusted to interest rates, where I think they're going to end up, you know I'm I'm not an economist, but I would I would think yeah. that somewhere there's a maybe a halfway Probably. point between what it is now and that, or you know Probably in the three less. to four range, you yeah. know, yeah, and, and that's not that's not exorbitant three to four inch percent interest rate but to get back to the workforce you know one of the great things in rotary right now is you know we always gave out scholarships to students going to college and now more and more i see more rotary clubs giving out trade scholarships so right. and, and part of trade schools today are now beginning to teach the technology that's needed to work within ai and so on and so forth so i, I think that that could be a really good thing for our country yeah, the trade schools are making their way back because a lot of folks aren't finding the value of college and college fees are just going exorbitant. I mean, it's just yeah, it's just, a lot. you know, a lot of money, a lot of money, $150,000 to go to college. That's and that's not the ex, that's cheap college. <laughs> More like 250000 for the upper schools. Yeah. You know, 80, 80,000, 85,000 a year. Easy. Easy. It takes a long time to uh, get that back. Yes, it does. But in today's world, we we have, you know, you need a, a master's or a PhD. You know, I'm an engineer. And, you know, it used to be you get a, a, a bachelor's, you know, maybe a master's. Now... <laughs> It's you have to get a master's, maybe a PhD, definitely an MBA. So, you know, for for most of the folks that follow along my route, they they will need to education never stops. It used to be the company would educate you when you came in. Of course, those big companies are gone. That's really old school. <laughs> and, well, no, and, my 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 daughter works for PepsiCo. Uh -huh. and, she, and she just got her master's from Kansas State University, yeah. and and they funded part of it. Yeah, that. they'll fund it. They'll they funded fund a lot of it, actually. So, which is great. Yeah, but a lot in the past, they would have their own training programs. Companies, right, Mexico, right, right, right. General Electric, Westinghouse, all the old old big 
companies where you would get educated by their their way but now they're leveraging the universities and they're paying for that so if you do have that opportunity definitely take take advantage of it because it will make a significant difference in your future for sure made a difference in my future because she graduated with her master's in may and now she's getting married so i have to pay for that wedding so <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, that, that's your last wad to go out, right? Big wad. Right. That's that's it. Yeah, well. Yeah, the wedding. Well. Wow. And people ask me about titles and they talk about my family, you know, one of those circles. The best title I've ever had is grandparent. It's, you know, yeah. the most rewarding. And I, I have to tell you, I love that. It's just great. So Yeah, that is the greatest feeling. I have to agree with that. Most people don't know that I'm a grandparent, but nice. I, I enjoy it. It is wonderful. <laughs> it's yeah. there's nothing like it. Nothing like it at all. So any uh, other thoughts that you have on the economy? We definitely interest rates aren't going to go much lower. If we were to go into a deflationary environment, I think the eco economists are, and everybody would be worried if we were ever to go back to the prices that we had pre-COVID and, and, and we can argue what caused that. I mean, I certainly have my opinion and others do too. What caused the uh, high inflation? Right. But, but well, I, will, uh, I will tell you, there's an economist I follow for many years who does a lot of work within my industry and uh -huh. uh, being the eternal optimist. I, I like the, the first part of what he says. I don't like the second part. <laughs> okay. the, the, the first part is he, he feels that we're going to be okay to like 2030. Uh -huh. And in 2030, we're going to hit the wall because all yep. of the debt is finally going to become due. And he yep. said, if you're a baby boomer, you'll be in good shape. You'll be retired. And if you're a millennial, you're screwed. That's what he said. So I, I don't like that part, but... You know, um, I know we've yeah. always been able to work out of any financial difficulty we've ever had. Just shows how resilient our economy really is. But uh, ho yeah. hopefully we can avoid those things and uh, the economy will continue to grow. Yeah, that, there's a lot, a lot about the 2030 that economists have said and technologists have said that that's when China will take over the world and the U.S. will no longer be number one. Right. And I think that is... Something if, you know, if you're in the quote, quote, free world, I think everybody needs to be concerned about that and how how to delay that if you can. Of course, China has scalability that we don't have. And most of our debt is a significant amount of our debt is owned by China. By China. So it makes complete sense to say if if the prediction is that 2030 is when China is going to take over the world and be predominant that they would then turn the screws on the US economy in order to control us because they are no they are now driving the the bus so that is what should drive everybody to think about how that that should be in the back of everyone's mind in my opinion exactly and you, and, you know you have to hope that not only that are they trying to do it economic you know on the economy side, but on the military side also. You know? That's right. That's right. You have to so how do we here. protect ourselves? How do we man start manufacturing that we haven't manufactured in the past? That yeah. means the manufacturing has to come back to America. We have to get the hold of the raw materials. Right now, we don't control any of the raw materials that, that make anything uh, of value. Uh, China controls all of that because they have scale. They've bought out the markets. Right. Of all the rare earths and and they're controlling that and they'll control that you know for the next five years and if they do and we don't have an answer to that we will in 2030 do exactly what that economist said there's no way we have to figure out a way we have five years to figure it out so to speak yeah. but i well, think we have to figure it out and and automation bringing that automation back in america and and manufacturing from scratch in america like we use what build america should be the imperative from my perspective well i think you know the pandemic 
prove that by the supply chain shortage, drugs, yes. you know, every in my industry was severely affected, you know, Absolutely. you had steel surcharges that, you know, people were paying for a pallet rack numbers that I never thought would be acceptable because they could all, cause they couldn't get it. And, you know, something that used to be an eight to 12 week delivery became a 36 week delivery. If you were lucky. Yeah. We used to be the steel making capital of the world. Now we don't make any steel here, here yeah. in the U S yeah. and, and, uh, so where are those guys who said we'll, we turn the country into a service, a, a service economy we will be all right. You know, we don't need to make anything here. Any that when people said that, that scared me. I don't know how about, about you, but you know, yeah, for sure. You know, <laughs> that scared me. I mean, it goes right down the list. It's, you know, it's for health. It's military. You know, I mean, the reason we won the wars that we won is because we were an economic and manufacturing giant. We were. You know? Yeah. You in know the Cold I mean? War, people forget. Right. In the Cold War, right. we made everything. Yeah, exactly. We made everything here. Nothing was made really anywhere else in the world of any substance. Toys from Taiwan. Right. But right. And Japan. cars, but in Japan a, a bit. But really our infrastructure, the steel and everything. I mean, Bethlehem Steel just closed down in 2010. It hasn't been that long. Right. U.S. Steel also closing down plants left and right has only been over the last few years. So it's only been, you know, 10, 15 years since we've got out of making and producing infrastructure type materials to power the nation. So the question is, how, how do we pour money back into the infrastructure? The problem is there's no, we're used to high ROIs. Right. We want those return on investments and profitability. And how do you, how do you bring all that, that infrastructure back, which brings us back to energy. We don't have enough energy and our energy costs are going up. So what happens when you start pouring money into infrastructure, your rates go up and inflation ensues. So now we're in a circle. I don't have the answer, John. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a vicious circle. Well, vicious if we had circle. the answer, Jim, you and I, we'd be writing books. But uh, Well, <laughs> even if you have the answer, no, but to get anybody to listen to you is probably right. hard anyway. Right, right. And, but, and it goes back to what you said in leadership at the beginning. It's all about trust. You have to have something to say, and people trust you, and you can lead with that. I think what the, the big thing we need to realize is that we have our work cut out for us. And we have to develop a plan to do that. And if we don't do that, we're, we're going to not, you know, we're not going to be the leaders in the world. So we need to do that. Yeah, we absolutely. It's the same thing for your business or anything you do. Develop a plan and uh, focus on it. Make sure you're, you know, engaged. And bring or bring with you some like-minded people and... And if you have some naysayers, don't push them out because they're good for you. They keep you on your toes. Exactly. They, you know, they may have some great points, you know. Yeah, because it's all about buying and trust. And if you don't have a balanced team, if you have a bunch of carbon copies of yourself, the likelihood of success is very, very low. You need to have that contrary person. But like you said, trust and respect them for what they have and their perspectives that will make you stronger as a whole. And you can both win together. Exactly. Exactly. So isn't that what marriage is all about? Well, I don't someone, know. Marriage some, is quite someone, right. someone who will let you know when you're not doing the right thing, even though you trust and respect each other. Right. So, yeah. And, yeah. and that's the success to a key marriage is, if you can uh, deal with that for a good marriage, you know, it's going to make you a better person and a stronger marriage. I couldn't agree more. You know, trust and respect is essential for a marriage and for life. I, I like that. And maybe that's where we end it here today, John. Any other closing thoughts? I think it's a pretty good way. Right, I just want to thank you, Jim. I, I enjoyed the dialogue and conversation today. And, you know, I think you're doing a great job. You know, this is all about helping people to get where they want to go. And I, I think you're providing a tremendous service to do that. 
in business. And the reason, you know, I like to put a little personal in there because it, it's all combined, those four circles, you know. I love and, it. Uh, you, you need to, you know, you need to do that in order to be a good leader. You need to be diverse and, and, and do those things. So I think it's great. So thank you so much for having me today. John, thanks for taking the time out of your incredibly busy schedule. Uh, you're doing so many things for so many people and leading in so many different ways. Really appreciate you taking time. You're, you're just so busy. And as your wife said, <laughs> they broke the mold when they made you, John. You're, <laughs> you're one of a kind. There's nobody like you I've met. So thank you so much for really guiding us on the leadership path. Thank you, John.